Well, good morning. It's good to have all of you here. It's always nice to see familiar faces and new faces and to be able to just to spend a little time in reflection with all of you this morning. Uh, the reason why I chose the topic before I start the prayer is really a reflection of my own spiritual life and also what I try to help the young men that uh, we work with here kind of live in reality. We always talk about live in reality. That lots of times we can have these ideas, aspirations, and notions which are different from the reality of that God is presenting to us, and then we, we miss it, right? We miss it right when it, it's happening right in front of our eyes. And so the, the notion of incarnational faith is to just be able to meet God in the present moment. So let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of this day, for the gift of faith, the gift of life, and the gift of your Son. And we ask that you would send your gift of the Holy Spirit to be with us now, that as we spend this time just in reflecting on the good things that you do for us, this time would bear the fruit in our lives that you desire, more than we could hope, ask, or imagine. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. In the back of the breviary, uh, which is the prayer book that priests and religious uh, and lay people are invited to pray each and every day for the Liturgy of the Hours. There's actually a poetry section, uh, which I kind of find both fascinating and also kind of uplifting that the church would see poetry as something that would be useful for prayer, uh, with the beautiful images and the conciseness of the language. And there's one poem that I refer to a lot as I kind of flip through the back pages, and it's called The Pulley by George Herbert. And this is what uh, the poem is. When God at first made man, having a glass of blessings standing by, let us, said he, pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches, which dispersed lie, contrast into a span. So strength first made a way, then beauty flowed, then wisdom, honor, pleasure. When almost all was out, God made a stay, perceiving that alone of all his treasure, rest in the bottom lay. For if I should, said he, bestow this jewel also on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me, and rest in nature, not the God of nature. So both should losers be. Yet let him keep the rest, but keep them with repining restlessness. Let him be rich and weary, that at least if goodness lead him not, yet weariness may toss him to my breast. If goodness lead him not, yet weariness may toss him to my breast. Again, I kind of alluded to it in my opening comments. I don't know if you've had these experiences. I, I imagine that you, that you have, but sometimes when you've, you've built up to a large event or maybe a life experience, uh, maybe it's a, a vacation that you're going to, to go on or some sort of, you know, just special moment in your life, and then you get there, or even Christmas morning, let's say, and then all of a sudden after the torrent of all the activity, there's a little voice inside of you that kind of says with a bit of sadness, is that it? Is that it? I remember that God was kind of uh, doing something sneaky inside of me uh, when, um, after being a few years ordained, I was able to go on vacation with a priest friend of mine, uh, and some people gave us uh, a house that they owned in Florida to go use, and beautiful house, and white sandy beaches, and we got to golf in the morning, and, you know, we cooked dinner in the evening, and I said, you know, let's just go to the chapel nearby, the, the the Catholic parish, because priests are like spies, we like to see what our brothers are doing all over. So we kind of snuck in, and I remember just, you know, we saw that obviously the, the Eucharist was present, and so we just said, well, let's just stop and, and make a time of prayer. And I remember thinking at that moment, that was the best that I felt that entire week. You know, we celebrated Mass every day in the house that we were at, but I remember when I was kneeling there saying to God, like, what are you doing to me? Like, what are you doing to me right now? That here I am surrounded by all this beauty, and yet 
In the words of George Herbert, there is this restlessness inside of me. No matter how good, no matter how beautiful, or sometimes how disappointing, there is something inside of me that just says, is this it? Is this really your will for my life? Is, is, are you really present here? Is this really what I was created for? And the answer that we actually come to realize is, is no. That the entire world cannot satisfy the human heart, and yet, at the same time, God comes to us in our daily existence. And so it's really the matter of us making ourselves aware of the divine and the eternal in our daily experiences that help us to quench that restlessness that's in our hearts. Because if I try to do it merely by external observance, it's always going to fall short. If I try to accomplish my own image of how things ought to be, like a bad Pinterest expedition, it never turns out like the picture. And I think to myself, what is wrong? So the first thought that I would like to um, share with you is just just that. The first obstacle to us, I think, being able to engage God in the present moment is the difference between our ideal and the reality. Our ideal and the reality. I remember when I was a student here, that I was meeting with my spiritual director, and in a moment of just kind of spiritual frustration, I just said, you know, I just want to be holy. And he said, kind of snarkily, I might add, what, are you expecting to start floating when you pray? And I said, well, that would be nice. (laughs) Nothing ostentatious, just a few inches. Just a little nod from God that, you know, progress was being made. And he responded with this. He said, do you think that you are closer to God now than you were last year? Yeah, I think so. Do you think that you're slightly more charitable than you were a year ago? I think so. Then what are you longing for? Why are you so focused on the external when the internal reality is making itself present if you would just open yourself up to it. One of the obstacles, and that's what this priest helped me with, the first one that I wrote down was a lack of perspective. A lack of perspective. I got into uh, a little debate with one of my professors uh, this past year. I'm taking some classes at the Catholic University. And sometimes I just can't help myself. (laughs) And so he was giving, uh, we were having a class on the family, on the domestic church. And he was giving this example of the architect Frank Lloyd Wright, who designed the Guggenheim, uh, and also designed uh, a house that's, uh, I think, titled Falling Waters. And it's this beautiful house built on these waterfalls as the river kind of comes down. And he was trying to speak of the reality of the family being able to teach the church about family life because of the lived reality. And so he said, look at this beautiful house. And here's how the light comes into the house. And and here's how you have all these, uh, as you walk through the house, this is what Frank Lloyd Wright was trying to communicate to people as they go through this little narrow hallway into this grand room, almost like a birthing experience, and all these nice kind of tangential metaphors that he was bringing. And so I said to him, I said, can you Google search that house for me? This is the middle of class. I can't help myself. And so he brings it up and I said, look at all the photos. How many of those photos are taken from inside the house? None. They were all shots of the house from down the waterfall. It's perspective. I said, you see, what happens, I imagine, is that if I bought that house 
I might enjoy standing outside of it and looking at it more than living inside of it. Because you lose the beauty of the perspective. What does that mean for us? Well, no matter what our vocations may be, sometimes we need the grace of perspective given to us by the other so that they can remind us of the beauty that we're actually living in, even though if I'm in that house, all I see is a bunch of dirty laundry and dishes that have to be done. That God and the church and our friends through spiritual guidance help to give us the perspective to remind us that despite our own lack of perspective, that you know, we can't see the forest through the trees, that we exist in this beautiful relationship with God. But I can't see it, Lord. All I see is a mess, and a narrow hallway, and another problem to solve today. Is this really what you've called me to? Is this really a grand vocation? Is this really holiness? There it is. With Mary. Think about Bethlehem. How many pictures do we have that are taken from inside the cave looking out? None, really. We all have these idyllic pictures of what it looks like from the outside that lack the smell. Really the smell. I was going to get into more detail. I'll just leave it at the smell. I don't know if you've ever been near cows before. But as we sit there looking at Christmas cards with our apple cinnamon candles burning and Nat King Cole singing in the background, we lose the perspective of the incarnational grittiness that Mary experienced with God's presence. It was dirty. It was messy. It was cold. There was fear of abandonment, fear of attack from the outside. And I know that Mary has an immaculate heart, but so I'll, I'll just, I'll throw Joseph under the bus. Go to Joseph. <laughs> that I imagine Joseph, at least, in his heart was saying, is this really it? Is this really where I'm supposed to be? Is this really God's will at this moment? Because I can't see it. And what I smell and what I do see seems to lack a little bit of what I would imagine this ought to have looked like. And so we give in to despair. Because my image isn't God's image. Or to put it in incarnational terminology, the events of my life aren't created in my image. They're created in God's instead, and that bothers me. Come on, God, get your act together. This isn't what it should look like. Instead, with Mary, what we can do is pray to have her heart that just remains and gazes on the face of Jesus in the midst of the grittiness and from inside the house, and from inside the cave, and even from beside the cross. It's an incarnational reality. And I tell guys all the time that are studying here, because they they have this real, it's it's really, it's, it's it's a grace. They have a zeal, right, for the priesthood, which they ought to have. Sometimes they have attached to it an unrealistic ideal. The church will have no more problems once they're ordained because they have been sent at last. And they'll have churches full of people that are just devout and pray all the time and just agree with everything the church says. And there are no confession lines because all is bliss. 
with the way that they preach and conversions happen, you know? And it's not real. I remember a good friend of mine when he got married, and they were only a year in, and he said this, he goes, you know, the toughest part of marriage is this, that I came in with all of my own ideas about what it would look like, and then I discovered that she had her own ideas too. And her ideas aren't the same as my ideas. And so we don't always get along. Because it's difficult. That's not always what I imagine. So the ideal versus the reality. And to be able to let go, again, sometimes for our own polished version of what we think things ought to look like. And to just rejoice in the incarnational grittiness of our lives sometimes. And to realize that Jesus enters into the grittiness. He enters into the smell. He's there in the mess. He's there in our daily lives. The other temptation that happens that can keep us from being able to encounter God in the present moment is just that our own interior lives or our imaginations are actually ripped from the present. You ever heard the expression that I received the question, where are you right now? It's the first question that, that God asks Adam and Eve. Where are you? It's not because they're really good at hide and seek. It was an interior question. Where are you? Where have you gone right now? And what I imagine is that the reason that Adam and Eve were hiding is because they weren't living in the present. They were living in an ill-conceived notion of the future, of what it would look like when God returned. Upper room. Where are you? We're hiding. Why? We're afraid of you. Why? Because we have our own imagination of what somebody that goes through this looks like when they come back. So we hide ourselves out of anxiety about the future, about regrets about the past. I'd share with you, uh, I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis. Uh, one of the books uh, that he wrote during uh, the Great World War was Screw Tape Letters. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but Screw Tape Letters are actually, C.S. Lewis took it upon himself to, he wrote these as a serial column in a British newspaper during the war. But they're called the Screw Tape Letters, and what it is that Screw Tape is a senior demon in hell. And he is apprenticing Wormwood who is a young novice demon. And he's trying to ruin a soul. And so what you have is these letters written back and forth about how to try to thwart the interior life of this man who was a British soldier in the Great World War. And it's a great uh, inspiration that C.S. Lewis had to see how the interior and the spiritual life live. And, and this one letter is written about one of the tactics of Satan to rip us out of the present moment. Now, I want to read part of this for you and to clarify for you, since this is written from the perspective of evil, when they say the enemy, they mean God, because God is evil's enemy. So this is what he said. The humans live in time, but our enemy destines them to eternity. He therefore, I believe, wants them to attend chiefly to two things, to eternity itself and to that point of time which they call the present. For the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Of the present moment and of it only, humans have an experience analogous to the experience which our enemy has of reality as a whole. In it alone, freedom and actuality are offered them. He would therefore have them continually concerned either with eternity, which means being concerned with him, or with the present, either meditating on their eternal union with or separation from himself, or else obeying the present voice of conscience, bearing the present cross, receiving the present grace, giving thanks for the present pleasure. 
Our business is to get them away from the eternal and from the present. With this in view, we sometimes tempt a human, say a widow or a scholar, to live in the past. But this is of limited value, for they have some real knowledge of the past, and it has a determinate nature. Biological necessity makes all of their passions art, so it is far better for them to live in the future. Biological necessity makes all their passions point in that direction already, so that the thought about the future inflames hope and fear. Also, it is unknown to them, so that in making them think about it, we make them think of unrealities. In a word, the future is, of all things, the thing least like eternity. The future is the thing least like eternity. How much time do you spend, and I ask myself this question all the time, how much time and emotional energy do you spend on unrealities? I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I'm not going to try to tell you never to worry about yourself or your family, about what may or may not happen. My brother, in fact, texted me last night. He's sending his oldest daughter off to college. So he took a photo of the, the car all packed up and said, it didn't seem that long ago that I brought her home from the hospital, and now here she goes. And so I texted him. I said, she'll do well. You've raised her well. My sister-in-law right now is frantic. Why? A mother's sorrow, watching her first one leave the nest, but also because she's living in unrealities. All the what-ifs. What if this? Well, what if that? Well, what if this? What if that? Well, if that happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, well, then that's going to happen, and we're going to have to call so-and-so, and then we're going to have to, and then she's, you know what? She's just going to have to come home. Don't go. Don't go. <laughs> I've already seen it. <laughs> just stay. I was listening to a talk one time by uh, a speaker at one of the Steubenville conferences, and he said, Sometimes, and he brought this little two-by-four beam out, he says, imagine if an Olympic athlete came out on the balance beam and just hunkered down and hugged it for three minutes and then slid off and goes, thank you. <laughs> he said, but how often do we go through life like that? I'm just going to hunker down here, make sure I don't fall off. And at the end of my life, I'll just kind of slide off the balance beam and say, thank you. But a life lived in unrealities freezes us. It limits our freedom and our joy. Because I'm always concerned about the other shoe falling. My mother has a knack for this, and so I think I inherited some of it from her. My mother is able to see the disaster that may happen at any turn. <laughs> I think she's really just sitting around waiting for my dad to die at this point. I really, she just, I, it's going to happen sometime. I just don't want it to happen when I'm out by myself with him. So we're just going to sit in the apartment and wait for 20 years. <laughs> and then when it happens, I'll say, you see, I told you. <laughs> And so we're trying to encourage our parents, no, go live while you're still alive. Don't wait for disaster to come. Don't live in unreality. And this is not the same as being irresponsible. That's not what I am promoting here at all. Irresponsibility means I'm actually naive to the present. I'm naive to reality around me. There's a difference between fear and anxiety. You see a bear, you should run. Actually, you shouldn't run, sorry. You should stand still. <laughs> but you should have a natural fear of knowing this thing can kill me. It's a great natural response, fight or flight. Anxiety, say, I'm not going to go to Colorado. There's a lot of bears in Colorado. And so I'm not gonna go. 
because of an unreality that exists. It's kind of a silly example, but how often do we do that in our lives? I'm not going to have this conversation because I know how they're going to respond. So I'll do nothing. Unreality. Here, lots of times as a priest, I'm not going to go to confession because I know how that's going to go. And what is this young celibate guy know anything about anyway? He's probably just going to look at me with some sort of disappointing scowl. And so I'm not going to go. I'm going to hide myself in the upper room. I really think that was the difference probably between Mary and the apostles. Mary didn't fear Jesus coming back. They did in a certain way. Filled with anxiety. She was filled with hope. She always lived in the present. With an expectation of the good things that God was going to do. Instead of creating her own unrealities, the bad things God might do to us. So don't give in to the temptation. In fact, uh, I remember something, lo and behold, that I learned in my world religions class, scandalous, about Buddha. Her- heretical. No kidding. There's a story, though, that I remember vividly, uh, and I'm, I'm not an expert in Buddhism, so I'll probably mess it up a little bit. But there is a vision of all the armies of the world coming against Buddha when he was meditating to try to drive him out of that. And the story goes that he said, you are not real and the earth is my witness. And he touches the ground and they vanish in front of him. Unreality. There's lots of times throughout my day, sometimes, where I'll, I'll, I'll knock or I'll touch my desk. Get back to reality. Don't live in the unrealities that my imagination is conjuring up right now. And the two ways, again, that uh, this happens to us is that we can be focused on anxiety about the future or also the wounds of our past and replaying things over and over and over and over again. How often do I hear this as a priest? Father, I I believe that God has forgiven me, but I cannot forgive myself. Why? Because I keep being stuck in the past, that I believe that my mistakes define me, that a moment in the past defines me instead of the reality of who I am today. Can you imagine if the great saints fell into that trap? St. Augustine, what if you watch around saying, I'm, th- I'm just a thief, and a guy that had a mistress and got her pregnant out of wedlock, that's who I am. No, you are the doctor of grace. Or St. Paul, who was well aware of his past. Yeah, I kind of persecuted the church, and I stood there and watched Stephen be stoned to death, and I, can, I consented to that. Is that who he is? No, you are my great apostle to the Gentiles. That we have to sometimes make an offering of our past to allow God to recreate us in the present. Create a new heart in me, O God. Put a steadfast spirit within me. Help me to live in the reality of the present moment and to encounter you there. Holy cow. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going. Point two. No, I'm kidding. All right, here we go. (laughs) Okay. Wilfred Stinnison uh, wrote a book called Into Your Hands, Father, a reflection on really trying to obey God's will at every moment. And when he speaks about living the present, this is what he says. He says, it is an inexhaustible source of wonder and admiration that God's will, which is so great and so far-reaching that it encompasses the whole universe, can make itself so small. Every person comes to the world with a dream of doing something great with his life, 
something that will make an imprint and bear fruit. God himself inspires these dreams. God is, of course, the one who makes the human person great. If only we could understand that we can only realize our dream by being totally present to the little and insignificant things we have to do at each moment. We encounter the infinity of God only in the present moment. The more we are recollected in the moment, the more clearly does the eternal now of God reveal itself to us. This is a great little image. The infinity of God comes to us through a funnel. It becomes so little and so narrow that it is difficult for us to recognize it. It comes only drop by drop through the small opening. The funnel is the present moment. When I put my mouth to the funnel, I am nourished by infinity. Yeah, wow. God makes himself so small that he comes to us in this present moment. The present moment becomes, in a sense, a sacrament of eternity for us. Or as De Cassad says in his great work, Abandonment to Divine Providence, he says this, The divine will is a deep abyss of which the present moment is the entrance. If you plunge into this abyss, you will find it infinitely more vast than your desires. Do not flatter anyone nor worship your own illusions. They can neither give you anything nor can receive anything from you. Receive your fullness from the will of God alone. It will not leave you empty. Adore it, put it first before all things. Tear all disguises from vain pretenses and forsake them all going straight to the soul reality. The reign of faith is a death to the senses. It is their spoilation, their destruction. For the senses worship creatures, and faith adores the divine will. Destroy the idols of the senses, and they will rebel and lament, but faith will triumph because the will of God is indestructible. When the senses are terrified or famished, despoiled or crushed, then it is that faith is nourished, enriched, and enlivened. Faith laughs at these calamities as a governor of an impregnable fortress laughs at the useless attacks of an impotent foe. When a soul recognizes the will of God and shows a readiness to submit to it entirely, then God gives himself to such a soul and renders it most powerful succor under all circumstances. Thus it experiences a great happiness in this coming of God and enjoys it the more, the more it has learned to abandon itself at every moment to his adorable will that we need to quiet the senses, my own expectations, let them go ahead and revolt as long as faith is perceiving the presence of God at this moment. Mary. Have you ever noticed how a lot of the parables of Jesus have to do with a woman in the home? Hmm. How about the parable of Jesus when he says, the kingdom of God is like a woman who is needing flour. When it's ready, she adds a little yeast so the dough may rise. The kingdom of God is like a woman who loses a coin and searches for it. And after she has swept the entire house, she rejoices because she has found it. The kingdom of God is like a persistent woman who prays always and bothers her neighbor so much until he gives her what she wants. The kingdom of God, or you, are like a light put on a lampstand, not under a bushel basket. Put on a stand so it may shine. The kingdom of God is like salt that seasons food. If it loses its taste, for what good is it? It is thrown out and trampled underfoot. The kingdom of God is what Jesus perceived in the home with Mary. Every moment, the daily tasks, the reality of her life with him. That through these little acts, these little everyday acts, the funnel of eternity becomes present to us if we just open our interior eyes to see it. Jesus didn't have to create new words. The kingdom of God is like the flowers of the field. It's like the birds of the air. The kingdom of God, you can't escape it. But you can't ignore it. You can't escape the kingdom of God, but you can't ignore it. 
You can become blind to it because it's not living up to your own perceived realities of what it should be. You can become blind to it because your mind is not in the present, but is either in the future or the past. You become blind because you think that the kingdom of God ought to be a little more cleaned up than this. The kingdom of God should look different than the inside of my house, than the inside of my vocation. The kingdom of God is there. And Mary had the benefit, it was a benefit, a grace, of having God beside her the entire time. So too do we. That God is with us. And the way that we can try to quiet our senses and to open ourselves up to God is in two primary ways. And I had a lot more to say, but I'll, I'll sum it up. The first, through the Word of God, through Scripture. Peter Kraft has a great biography that he wrote, or actually just uh, kind of a Cliff Notes version of Augustine's Confessions. And St. Augustine had his conversion in a garden, lo and behold, in a garden, where he heard a little voice. It says a sing-songy voice, sounds like a little boy or girl kind of singing that says, take and read, take and read. And he opens up to St. Paul's letters. And the first thing that he reads is the fruits of the flesh versus the fruits of the Spirit. And his heart is set on fire that he saw truth. Now, Peter Kraft, in his book, he says, I'm not saying that Bible bingo is the way to go. He says, lest you open up your your Bible and the first line that you read is, Judas went out and hanged himself, and then the next time you open it up, it says, go and do likewise. (laughs) But he says that God's word is alive. It's a living thing. It isn't just some sort of ancient text that God continues to speak to us in our present reality and makes himself known to us through his word. And as St. Jerome said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. How can I hear the word of God in my own daily interactions if I can't even read the word, if I don't know it? There's this great passage from the Old Testament when it says the prophet Samuel was asleep and as God calls out to him it says he did not yet recognize the voice of God. So he gets up. Next time you hear that voice say speak Lord your servant is listening. Peter Kreft says that from the Middle Ages on St. Augustine is shown with a burning heart and scripture in his hand. He says, we are pray that if they built statues of us, we wouldn't have iPhones and pillows in ours. Sacraments, that the divine comes to us, of course, in the Eucharist. God funnels himself all of eternity. Whether I believe it or not, whether I feel it or not, whether I perceive it or not, there to the divine funnel of God's eternal life comes and greets me. And then lastly, importance of some sort of daily examine. I'm sure you've had talks on that before. But to be able to pause at some point during your day and to live in reality and to ask the Holy Spirit to illumine your heart to where God is present small miracle of the funnel of eternity coming into your home, coming into your daily work, coming into your relationships. God is there. And that all of our desires are fulfilled. And we have this sense of peace and this sense of joy to live as sons and daughters of God when we just kind of let go of all of our preconceived notions and live in the present moment with Jesus. So I just wrote this little thing this morning. Just one line. Mary lived with Jesus, 
and so can we. That was the secret of her life, of her happiness. Mary didn't really, I might get some time in purgatory for this statement, Mary really didn't do anything. She received everything. She received the presence of God. She was open to receive the reality of God in her life. That's what defines her. My soul proclaims greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, because he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed because the Lord has done great things for me. Not I have done great things for God. God has done great things for me. And holy is his name. Funnel of eternity received. So we pray, again, just that you don't become discouraged sometimes by the grittiness or the ordinariness of your life. Not to give in to uh, the despair if you're not floating when you pray. I'm still working on it. And that as we began the talk with that poem, The Pulley, that if all the blessings that God gives us don't draw us to his heart, let the weariness remind us of our need for him and draw us to him. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death.